morning. It's good to see everybody's faces, no masks, and that's awesome. Uh, please rise and join me, if you will, as we sing, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. first scripture this morning comes from 1 John, way back in the back of the New Testament. And it's uh, verse 5, chapter 5, which is at the end of 1 John, and it starts with verse 9. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that He has testified to His Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony God gave us, eternal life. And this life is his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. As you're able, would you stand this morning as we affirm our faith with some readings from Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. no. In all things, we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord, thanks be to God. Amen. As we gather this morning to pray, we'll be singing Spirit of the Living God as we enter our prayer time.
Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for the days to come. We turn to you now with our hopeful prayers. Prayers of thankfulness for all that we have for this great country, for our family, and for our church. We lift up prayers today for those that are hurting, those that are grieving, those that are dealing with doctor's appointments and treatments and diagnoses. But God, we know that mostly we lift our prayers up for thankfulness that you are our God. You're the God that created everything we see. You spoke and the world was created out of nothing. You spoke and humanity was born and you spoke and we had companions and you spoke and we had a community and Jesus came to show us what it meant to be filled with love and mercy and grace. We hear these things, we know these things, we practice these things, but God, we also fail. And we ask your forgiveness for the times that we fall short, the times that we get self-centered, the times we think it's somehow about us. And we ask you to, as you send the Holy Spirit into our lives and our bodies and our hearts to help us have the eyes of Christ the ears to listen and the heart to love in all situations at all times. During these days after Easter, we recognize that Jesus has risen from the dead. But that's not the end of the story. He gave us the great commandment to love one another. The commandment to do unto others as we have them do unto us. And he taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear the scriptures from the Gospel of John this morning, we'll sing the Surely the Presence of the Lord. We're going to sing it through three times. As you're able, would you stand as we sing and then remain standing for the reading of the Gospel? Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. 
For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have, have my joy made complete in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they may also be sanctified in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. One of the things that I think the Christian church has done poorly over the years is uh, put mile markers in place. So if you've done these things, you think it's all over. A lot of people would say that day that you kneel and say some version of the sinner's prayer is that's the culmination of everything. But Jesus here asks us to be sanctified. He doesn't ever say that we are sanctified. He has been glorified. We are being sanctified. I can identify with that because I'm also, as most of you know, a recovering alcoholic. I'm not a recovered alcoholic. Neither are you a recovered sinner. We're recovering sinners. Amen. It's just the way it is. The human life is filled with sin and pain and suffering and misery, and that's what life is all about. Doesn't paint a great picture, does it? But then when we understand that those are the given things about life, we can rejoice in the fact that there's a rescue, there's, there's a way to be sanctified from that. Years ago, not that many years ago, I uh, became a, a watcher of a show called JAG. Some of y'all might have watched that. Uh, you know, it had Harmon Rapp, the, the uh, Navy guy, and it had Curl McKenzie. She was the Marine that was there. She was also a recovering alcoholic. And she had an experience, like many recovering people do, of a father that had been a drunk. And word came to her that her father was dying and she didn't really want to go to see him. But it was her father. And so she went to a hospice where he was laying there dying. And there was a priest there with him, like in so many of the cases when somebody's dying, there'll be some form of pastor there. He was telling her that she needed to forgive and remember the good times and be a part because she wouldn't have been there without him, that he was an important part of her life. And she got pretty self-righteous and she looked at him and he says, what makes you so sanctified that you can talk to me that way? And he very wisely said, I don't think I'm sanctified, but I hope I'm being sanctified. When I went before the board of ministry, my friend Rita, she's a pastor that I've known for years. One of the questions she asked me when I sat down there to be interviewed, it's a process, you know, where you do a lot of educational stuff and then you meet before these different sections of people and they're lay people and clergy and there's three different ones. There's a theological one and there's a, 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 a more practical one. And anyway, you sit in front of these people and they examine you with questions. 
I, I remember those things very clearly. It was an important day when we all went up there and all the people that I'd been going through seminary with were all there together. And some people passed and some didn't. The first thing I remembered happening was a lady, the conversation got around to they said, well, can you explain the Trinity? And I said, well, I have explained it. And uh, they said, well, tell us about it. And I said, well, I used to explain it to the confirmation class. And they said, well, did they get it? And I said, well, I don't know, they kept coming to church. <laughs> And, uh, and so I made a reference somehow or another to some biblical version of something. And one of the ladies there was going to nail me on that. She said, speaking of versions of the Bible, which one do you read? And I said, well, mostly I use the New Revised Standard Version because that's what our literature is in. And she said, uh, well, what do you, one do you think John Wesley used? She was going to be real cute. And I said, the one he wrote. And she said, he wrote the huh? <laughs> I said, yeah, John translated the entire Bible from Hebrew and from Greek into English. And I suspect he used the version he translated. Well, that ended that conversation. <laughs> but we had other conversations there. And the, what Rita said when I sat down, she said, Jack, she said, what's the state of your salvation? Anybody ever ask you that? I mean, this is different than that guy that knocks on your door and says, are you saved? This is a deeper question than that. What's the state of your salvation? What would you say if you were asked that? Well, my answer was, quickly, I'm still working it out. Which is the right answer. Because none of us have fully attained success in understanding our salvation. In other words, we're not sanctified yet. Well, John Wesley used a whole different terminology to explain this, and he talked about it in terms of, of grace. One of the main contributions that, well, John made many contributions that we don't even ever talk about, but y'all have all heard of the Great Enlightenment. In large part, it happened because of John Wesley. He was a big part of that. He did something that probably needs to happen in our country right now. It happened in England with him and changed the world in many ways. John started preaching houses. He started preaching in the streets. He started preaching in the miners' uh, fields. And he started a movement that was a grassroots movement. The people wanted more. And so they, he would not. He, he believed he was a, a, a Anglican priest. He did not serve communion in his preaching houses. He believed they should go to their neighborhood Anglican church to get communion. And so they'd be revved up. Now these preaching sessions were sometimes at five in the morning because they would then need to go to work. And so he would have these preaching sessions and, and the people would go down to the neighborhood church and bang on the doors. They were ready to receive communion and the priest wasn't there because he was in town hanging out with the lords and the rich folk. And they made so many demands that it really did revitalize the church because the people wanted more and the people were going to get more. Now I'm not talking about political rhetoric. I'm talking about people that want to be closer to God. And I believe that's a universal desire. I'm just not sure people understand what it is. I think we all have a hole that's, that needs to be filled up. I know for years I, I could fill it up pretty successfully with Miller Lite. I don't think it's any accident they call alcohol spirits. I think it quickly can replace yours. But so can work. And so can relationships. And so can many other things. But John Wesley determined that what we needed to understand that was that God has been in your life and work in your life since the minute you were knitted together in your mother's womb. And you know what I'm talking about when you look in the rearview mirror and you say, yeah, if it wouldn't have been for that, I wouldn't be where I am today. God had impact on your life even before you knew it, recognized it, or cared. God was at work in your life. Amen. And he called that preventing grace. It's been reworded now to call prevenient grace, but it's easier to understand it. It's kind of like preventative health care or preventative <laughs> dental care. You don't necessarily need work done at the dentist, but if you go often enough ahead of time, you need less later. Preventative health care. You get a physical every year so they can catch stuff before it's bad. That preventative things we do. That preventative grace has been at work in your life. And there comes a day 
when justification takes place and you sort of wake up and say, wow, God did this. I, I understand justification better because of, of WordPerfect and Microsoft Word. Uh, you know, you can type a paper like I did when I was in seminary and you can punch a little button and it lines it all up. And there comes a time in your life when you realize what God's been doing in your life and you give thanks for it and you want something more. That's the day we most often see when somebody walks down the aisle of the church and says, I want to join the church or, or I want to be baptized. That's what we see when that happens, that, that alignment has taken place and that's justification. But for a lot of Christians over the years, that was the end of the story. We laughingly say in the, in the preacher world, you know, when we do confirmation for young people, we put them through confirmation. We bring them to the front of the church. We either baptize or confirm them and we never see them again. There's so many people that think once I've done that, once I've made that statement, once I've said Jesus is Lord of my life, I don't have to do anything else. But that's not what Jesus is saying in the Gospel of John. He says, God, protect them and sanctify them. And to be sanctified, we have to be doing God's work. John Wesley started off thinking he needed to do that work so we could get to heaven. He was trying to earn his way to heaven. You know, that's the saddest part is you can't do that. It doesn't matter how good you are, you can't earn your way to heaven. And no matter how much you love your kids, your wife, your uncle, your aunt, your grandparents, you can't get them a ticket either. This is a personal decision that you have to make on your own. But once you make it, then God goes to work on your life. And it doesn't necessarily happen instantly. It just begins to happen. The decisions that you make are different. They lead you down different paths. You end up in a different place. And what we're looking for is that day when we call perfection, when we, when we attain the goal. What Paul talks about when he says in Corinthians, I press forward toward the mark, forgetting those things which lay in the past, I press forward to the goal. And the goal is the kingdom of heaven. But the kingdom of heaven is not just available when we die. The kingdom of heaven is available today. It's available to you right now. And it, the closer we can get into the kingdom of heaven, then the more work we find that we have to do for the kingdom. Wesley had another way of saying it. He said, if, you're, if you get head knowledge, and he was a head knowledge guy, he believed every fourth grader should be able to translate Hebrew to Greek, Greek to Hebrew, and back into English. Fourth grade. He was a head guy. And he was a heart guy too. And, but he said, if, you're, if your head knows it, and your heart gets it, then your hands and feet ought to show it. And I think that's the dilemma. So many times we, we get it. We know that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We're happy to profess that. We're happy to say it. And then we want that to be enough. One of the things that the church is guilty of is sometimes we get people that are willing and we use them up. Because in a perfect world, you would have a relationship with God first, a relationship with your family, and then you should have a relationship with the church. I believe it's essential. I don't think you can get close to God out on your own. Not and stay there because you resort to that kind of stinking thinking. You start thinking you know what you know. It takes other people to challenge you and push you a little bit and say, well, this is God. And in the Methodist church for most of my life missed the point. If you wanted to join the church in a Methodist church, we went down there and you said, the preacher would ask you, will you support this church? Well, the first thing we'd ask, have you been baptized? And then, if not, we'd take care of that. Then, will you support this church with your prayers, presence, gifts, and service? That is a very Methodist way. Oh yes, we're praying people. We are. Prayers, presence. Oh yeah, you need to show up. Gifts, well, yes. And gifts are not just money. It's time, talent, and treasure. And service, because you need to serve. But for so many times, I think, the church led the impression that was serve the church. It was not until 1996, I think, that we changed our wording on that thing and added prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. God has impacted your life. I know that it's true. You wouldn't be here today if it weren't true. Tell somebody that story. That's what changes the world. That's how the disciples, 12 of them, managed to get so many people into the movement. 
That's how Jesus was able to hand the keys to the church to Peter and says, upon you, I build the church. And he says to each of us today, upon you, I build the church. Amen. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about life. When I first went to my first meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous, they have a thing written on the wall. It says membership, here's membership requirements. We've got them back there on our wall if you want to read them, but it says you have to have a desire to be sober. It doesn't say you have to be sober. I wonder if maybe the church would be better off if we didn't have a sign that said, welcome if you have a desire not to sin. Instead of creating the impression that all of us are sinless. Because friends, I know you. <laughs> And we're not sinless. Amen. None of us. Amen. And so I think one of the reasons that people that don't go to church think that we're self-righteous and self-important is because the, the picture's been painted somewhere out there that those that go are better than those that don't go. They are not the enemy. And in fact, this scripture makes it absolutely clear that Jesus came for all of them. And if they don't know him, that's not their fault. Ultimately, that's our fault. And they may not ever learn it by us doing Bible thumping and quoting verses to them. I'm not very good at it, although I did a funeral a while back and one of the people said, said man, you really know a lot about the Bible. Well, I do read it a lot. And I can remember particular verses that mean something to me. But, but I also know that I've got a book that sometimes I need to read through it and look because I get them down wrong. I don't remember them exactly right. I don't get it exactly right. The word is coming from the book. The book is not the word. And we should not worship the book. We should use it. It's a tool. And, and I've found since I've been a preacher now around 20 years that I use them up. The pages get wrinkled and they get marked on them and I can't see... Uh, you know, I, I can see here what I preached on last year in this book, and at some point after about four or five years, I got to get a new one because they've got notes made, and the pages are wrinkled and they're torn. I got to tell you though, my third grade Bible they gave me when I was in third grade is back there in my office. is absolutely pristine. Pages are perfect. Didn't get opened. Didn't get used. Had a little zipper. I could carry it around. I think it's got some uh, offering up envelopes from other churches stuffed in it to bargain against page markers. But nobody taught me that it was okay to go in there and question it and write in it and use it for a tool. Somehow I thought it was something else. Jesus calls us into a world that we're not really a part of. But boy, it has influence on us, doesn't it? We spend more time sometimes worrying about what the world wants than what God wants. God's not concerned with a lot of the stuff, the stuff we worry about. I'm not even sure God really cares if there's potholes in the street. But God cares about how we treat each other. And what worries me most right now is the way I see people treating each other. And I'm not talking about y'all because I know all of y'all and we're treating people pretty well, I think. Our church has been very responsive to the people that use our food box out there. I got to tell you, uh, sometimes it's frustrating. I came the other morning to the church and there was a sack of <laughs> Chester's chicken. I don't even know where you buy Chester's chicken around here. And uh, it was just strewn all over the driveway. Evidently, we don't have any stray cats because around our house, it would have all been gone. It was just out there. And so, you know, I'm, here I am picking up little pieces of chicken bone, putting them in a the sack, putting it away. So I got curious because we have a camera on it. And I went and I looked for the... And the poor guy rode up here on his bicycle with a sack on it. And he filled up his little sack. And he had his chicken in a sack. And as he got on his bike, he almost fell off his bike. And all of it just spilled out everywhere. And he drove off. I mean, I wish he'd have picked it up. But you know what? Uh, he was probably embarrassed. He was probably flustered. And maybe I would have put my feet in his shoes for just a few minutes and be a person that's having to get my food out of a food box. Because that's not me. 
I'm suspecting it's not anybody in here. We're kind of blessed, aren't we? And so we have an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus for some people that really have significant need. Now, could they get a job? Maybe. Could they be doing something else? Maybe. But, you know, it's so easy to judge them and just not help them. And I know that I, I, my friend Danny Wayman was my senior pastor for a while, and he used to talk about this a lot. I know that we, 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 we United States people, we like to say, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Go get a job. Take charge. Well, and those of you that wear boots, go home, put them on, and try to pull yourself off the ground. Because you can't. Sometimes you need some help. Hey, you're talking to a guy that can't use his right hand much. I put my boots on the other day. It's difficult. It takes pulling on both sides. I have to get my wife to cut my food at the restaurant. It's a little embarrassing. I'm humbling. It is a little humbling. And I'm grateful. And hey, it's not long in the past. I can move my arm a little bit. And it'll get better as time goes along. But i got to tell you, sometimes we need to put ourselves in the shoes of those that don't know what we know. And they don't know why we do what we do. And that's that witnessing part. You know, I've had people all my life say, well, why do you go to church every week? Because if I don't, I become something I don't really want to be. I've been there. People ask me all the time why I quit being a police officer. And I've got to tell you, I was riding with a guy one night. His name was J.D. Harris. He was an older guy. He'd been around for a long time. And uh, we were working the midnight shift. Midnights in police work is sometimes pretty boring. And I, was, I didn't have any kids at that time. I said, J.D., you got any children? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, I got five of them. I said, what are their names? And he rattled them off. I said, how old are they? And he finally got the numbers out. And boy, God spoke to me right then. I did not want to grow up in a place of having a career where I didn't know how old my kids were, when their birthdays were, what their names were, where I was more focused on going out and doing something for me than I was of doing something for them. And it wasn't long after that I went into a different profession. I have a lot of people that have retired from police work. I, Kathy went with me. We went back to my 45th anniversary from Police Academy. And I love those guys dearly. We went through, the, it's kind of, Harry, it's kind of like boot camp. We went through stuff together. And I love them like brothers and sisters. But they're still telling the same jokes they were telling 45 years ago. They're still living the same life they did 45 years ago. Some of them, not all. And I'm so glad I have more diversity in my past than that, that I got out and found out about other stuff. And that's what I think God, when I'm talking about provenient grace, God knew I needed to do what I did. In 1988, I went to the pastor of my church. I was a member of Deer Park Methodist. I said, um, you've told me I ought to become a pastor. How does that work? And he said, well, it's simple. You go talk to the district superintendent. He'll sign some papers and we'll get you appointed to a little church somewhere in East Texas. And then on Monday, you'll drive up to Dallas and go to seminary. And then you'll come home on Friday and you'll preach to that little church for the weekend. I said, Jim, I've got an eight, six and an eight year old. How do you do that? He said, well, it'll work out. I said, yeah, I don't think so. Because I had a priority that those kids needed dad. They needed me to provide for them and do for them and be with them. So I ended up getting a better job, staying around doing other stuff in town, didn't worry about it for 20 years. But God never quit working on me and moving things around and setting the stage for this thing to happen and this thing to happen and the next thing to happen. And sure enough, in 2001, I went to work for the church. 2002, I went, well, actually 2002, I went to work for the church. 2001, my dad died. 2003, I was appointed to a church and then I finished seminary in 2005. A seminary in a, in a private university is about $500 a semester hour. It's 85 hours required. You can do the math real quick on that. 500 times 85, that's around 40 some odd thousand dollars. And I did all the seminary with no debt. God had set the stage. I knew that my sweet wife was going to be looking at me and saying, are you done studying yet? 
can we go out to eat? Can we do stuff? And I said, well, sweetheart, let's go check out getting you to college. And she went and signed up at Laterno University and got her bachelor's degree. Actually, I finished before she did as it worked out. And then I was the one saying, can't we go do that stuff? We did all of that, and we didn't have to borrow money. We didn't do it. God had set the stage. God's provenient grace was placing us in a place to be able to do something that I could not even begin to imagine. I never thought I would be here doing this in this incredible church now. And now that I'm getting old, a bunch of my buddies are retiring, and they're saying, why don't you quit? I could. I could retire. Well, partly because I'd be bored to tears. And partly because I don't think we're quite ready yet. I don't think we're done here. We've got some work left to do. Some work that I can be a part of. And that y'all can be a part of. And that we can make a difference. As, as people have said here, somebody in 1937 thought there ought to be a church here. And we stand on their shoulders. Now, they didn't have any idea it would look like this today. Or that we would be doing what we're doing today. They didn't know what it meant. And we don't know what it's going to be like in 10 years. But I believe that Christ wants there to be a church here, and I believe it's our destiny to make it work. And I think together we can do what this scripture says, is we can go out into the world and point to Jesus. That's really all we have to do. We, we can't save them. But we can point. And we can point to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and say Jesus is the way. Because that's what this scripture says. Those that don't know my name will die. And I don't wish that on anybody. Not that kind of death. And I believe God and Jesus, every preacher I know, and most Christians that I know would much rather see a world where everybody gets saved than the one where we pick and choose on who gets to go to heaven. So I think we have a calling. And I think that calling is to go out into the world and offer Christ and point to Jesus. And when we do, we're going to find that some of the stuff the world offers is irrelevant. Not important at all. Because what's important is what's forever. Love and Christ are forever. Amen. The world, it'll do whatever it's going to do. It's in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So in line with that, as we close our service out today, we're going to sing, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. It's my prayer that that's how we not only lead the service, but we leave as we go into that world in which we live. Let's sing together. You may be seated. Yeah, please stand as you say. I can hear you.
is the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit that sends us out into the world. Go in peace.